today we are starting a brand new series that we haven't done before, Bring Your Laptops, Come as a Workshop. We'll be talking about privacy tools, how you can use them, how you can install them, and along the way learning quite a bit about online privacy. Uh, we are extremely fortunate today. We have great people speaking to kick off our inaugural session. And um, <laughs> uh, Mozilla uh, is being generous in sending us two people to talk about their uh, light beam. Um, so uh, Garrett and Monica, these are both CS folks who speak English. So we're really in good shape. Um, and you've got their bios. Uh, if you have not signed up on our mailing list but you want to hear about the rest of our sessions, please do so. If you need information about Wi-Fi, there's information up there or also on the feedback form. And let me just preview a couple of the sessions that we have coming up in the future. Uh, we're going to have a session from Peter Eckersley. He's the technologist at uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we'll have a session from Tom Lowenthal teaching about Tor uh, and about uh, encryption. Um, and we will also have a speaker, um, uh, and I think you'll really like him, on April 15th, so do your taxes early this year. Um, Bruce Schneier will be speaking, and if you're, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're really fortunate to be able to have him come join us. So we have a very exciting time planned for the month of April. Next month will be a little quiet. Um, this session is a little bit more accessible, kind of shows you what's going on online and how you can visualize some of the tracking that's happening. So thank you very much to our speakers today. Cool. Thanks, Alicia. Hi, everybody. My name is Garrett, and I'm a security and privacy engineer at Mozilla. And Monica is also a security and privacy engineer. So we're going to talk about a Firefox add-on called Lightbeam today. But to get started, I want to give you guys some background and hopefully explain how online tracking works. Um, I'm going to be asking you questions, so please don't be shy. Um, to get started, I want to talk about just the overall concept of privacy. So does anybody here want to volunteer their definition of privacy? Anybody at all? Yeah, go for it. Great, that's a really good definition. So he said that privacy is the ability to encapsulate information and control access to it. That's a really important part of privacy and it allows us to selectively reveal ourselves to the world around us. Privacy is a really important right that is protected by the US Constitution and also various legislation both in this country and around the world. So it's an important uh, part of the fundamental rights for citizens in a lot of democratic countries. Um, tracking is antithetical to privacy. So when you go around the world and you do different things, you leave little things behind. Um, for example, when you go through a toll on the highway and you use EasyPass, you leave a record that your car was there, and that's tied back to your identity. Um, when you go into a supermarket or a mall, there might be security cameras that record your face, and so there's a record that you're left there too. So you leave little breadcrumbs all over the world, and tracking is the process of taking those breadcrumbs and forming a story about where you were, and also maybe where you are and where you're going. So some examples, as I just said, are security cameras. There are probably cameras in this room somewhere. Great. <laughs> that, yeah, so I'm being tracked right now for you guys, for your benefit. Um, EasyPass is another example. And then uh, another interesting one is public record data brokers. So there are corporations that exist to collect information from various institutions, the government, other corporations, um, et cetera, um, off on the internet. And they collate and process that data to then provide services for other people that allow them to look up profiles of individuals. So that often uses offline data, um, but because it's building profiles about people and their behavior is a form of tracking, um, and it's pretty interesting. So that's a lot of kind of uh, physical, real-world tracking, or not real-world, but meat space, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but there's also tracking that happens online, which you've probably heard of. Um, so a lot of different forms of online tracking exist. Sometimes a website will track you because they want to know what the visitors to their site 
are interested in, the articles that they view most often or that they like on social media, um, and they want to know where they're coming from. So that's called analytics, and there are lots of companies that will provide this service to websites, or they can do it themselves. But so analytics will track the behavior of a website's users, and it's often, it can be set up to build profiles of those users um, across an individual site. Um, advertisers who serve advertisements on web pages also sometimes track users, and they do this to build up profiles for what's called behaviorally targeted advertising. So the basic idea is that if you know what a person has bought in the past on different websites, you can serve them more relevant ads. Um, so they will track people across multiple websites for the purpose of building these profiles. And there's a lot of money in that industry. Um, and then finally, recently we know from Edward Snowden that the US government and other world governments are using online tracking um, to perform surveillance and to do whatever that is that they want to do, which is kind of secretive. Um, I don't really know. So as I said before, there are a lot of reasons why you want to track online. And some of them are actually legitimate. So site owners um, might be able to get better content for their visitors when they use analytics. And there may be some consumers who think targeted advertising helps them make good buying decisions. And they find that that kind of assistance is helpful when they are buying things on the internet. Um, and then finally, advertising is an important part of the revenue stream for most internet companies. And uh, tracking is a part of a lot of advertising companies' business models. So indirectly, it is part of a major source of income for the internet. Um, but there are a lot of problems with online tracking. So the first one is just a vague one of user perception. Um, can you guys just like raise your hand if you've ever been shopping for something online and then gone to a different site and seen ads for the stuff you were looking at on that site? Let's go ahead and raise your hands. That's almost everybody in the room. Um, how did that make you feel? You can just raise your hand or call it out. Like, Anybody want to share what that experience was like the first time you saw it? Irritated. So someone was irritated. I find it to be creepy. Um, and I don't know about you. Yeah? Right. He said, it, he said it was surprised that it knew exactly what he was looking at the other day. So um, the first thing is that there is poor visibility. People don't understand how online tracking works. And it all kind of happens behind the scenes. So unfortunately, right now, you have to really understand technology and the internet very well to understand how it's all happening. Um, and then it also confuses the mental model of the web. So as this gentleman just said, it was surprising to him. He didn't understand how one site knew what was happening on a different site at a different time. Um, and again, this is because there is poor visibility into the actual process. Um, it is also seen, as he said, uh, he said it was invasive. It was violating his basic assumption of privacy. And some people see it as creepy. They just don't think that that information should be following them around. Um, it seems strange. So, and the final thing is that it's non-consensual. Um, if you are using the internet with default settings in any web browser, you are being tracked by hundreds of companies all the time without you knowing about it. Um, and there's no way right now for you to say, yes, I would like that, or no, I do not like that. You have no choice whatsoever. There are things you can do, and we'll talk about it later, to improve the situation. But by default, there is nothing you can do. And that is not awesome. There are some other problems, too, that go beyond that. So the first is that uh, these online tracking companies are building up profiles of all of your behavior online. This is an article from the New York Times in 2006. Uh, it says, a face is exposed for AOL searcher number 4417749. So in this example, AOL, which is a search engine company, I said is and was at the same time, um, my, my bad, um, released a, a list of 20 million web search queries, so things people had typed into AOL's search engine, um, for the purpose of doing of researchers analyzing it. But what they hadn't thought about was that so what they did was they, they identified each individual customer by unique number. So they, they anonymized the data. And they thought that by doing so, there wouldn't be anything that would tie the individual searches back to actual people in the real world. But that was totally wrong. There is enough information in web searches, even just uh, 20 or 30 or 40, to usually uniquely identify an individual. So in this case, the reporters who wrote this story 
we're able to uh, take this individual and find the actual person, Thelma Arnold, um, and go and talk to her about her web searches. So that is, I think, kind of surprising to a lot of people who think that what they, they type into their computer is, is secret and private. You know, we can find a lot in a search engine or in our email. Um, and if that information is collected, the metadata can be used to build surprising profiles that are more identifying than you might originally think. Um, and the last problem is that ad tracking is not only used for tracking anymore. So this story is from the Washington Post from late last year, uh, December 10th. And documents released by a uh, former NSA contractor, Edward Snowden, uh, show us that the NSA has been using Google's unique advertising tracking cookies to identify targets of surveillance and direct more targeted hacking attacks at their computers. So the NSA doesn't even need to build a global infrastructure for tracking individuals. They can just piggyback off the one that advertising has already created. And we know that's actually happening now. So um, you might think it's OK for a corporation to do it, but governments are very powerful compared to corporations. And they're using the exact same system to uh, do whatever they want. It's all in secret. Um, before I get started on this part, it's a little technical. Are there any questions, real quick? Quick questions? Shoot, I have mics for you. Um, so she asked uh, if I post a comment on a blog and it says it's anonymous, uh, am I still being tracked? Is that right? Um, and so that depends on the website itself and how it's being set up. So uh, there's no guarantee, but it's possible that you aren't being tracked either way. And so talking about how it actually works might illustrate um, how these things happen in the first place. Yeah. Um, quickly, uh, browsers do offer an API called the Location API that allows uh, websites to ask for information about where you are located. Um, all browsers that I know of, Firefox and Chrome certainly, have an interface that will ask for permission from the user, and they can it will pop up each time the site asks for the information by default, unless they explicitly say, I allow this for this site forever and such like that. So the browser itself is not collecting data, but it's providing a way for websites to ask for the data. And if that site is a tracker, then it could use that information. Well, it, it uses standard mechanisms like GPS or Wi-Fi triangulation. Um, let's talk about it in the Q&A, because I'm getting a little bit running out of time. Thanks. Um, cool. So I'm going to go quickly through uh, how tracking works in a very high-level way. And this is technical, so if there are any questions like pertaining to this uh, and you're confused, feel free to stop me and let me know. Um, so the first thing I want to explain is cookies. Um, I like working at Mozilla because our browser lends itself to cute cartoon animals and comics really easily. Um, but so the first thing you have to understand is cookies. So uh, Raise your hand if you've heard of browser cookies. Again, everybody in the room, right. So everyone has an idea of cookies and that they maybe we should clear them sometimes, or if things go wrong, you should clear the cookies. It won't fix everything magically. Um, so cookies are an old web technology that allows websites to store small amounts of information in your browser. So the way that it works is, first, a site will set a cookie. So when you go to a website, it will set a cookie in the response it sends back to your browser. So you ask for a web page, and the site says, here's a web page, and by the way, here's a cookie, and associate the cookie with me, the website. Um, the browser will save it. Yes? So that's um, a, a base internet protocol. Uh, it's, the, it's headers in HTTP, some RFC specifies it. So the server says set cookie, and then gives a cookie. And then in the future, the browser will return that in a header itself. Uh, it would. Well, yeah, we'll get we'll get to that in a second. It would break the internet. Is is the answer to your question? Um, so then, later requests to that site will include the cookies. So cookies are tied to specific websites. A, a certain site, say Amazon.com, sets a cookie, and then the browser will return it in the future. So uh, they are used in a number of ways. The original use is for maintaining state in the browser. Um, so they might store things like usernames. So if you log into Amazon.com and you give a username and a password, 
Amazon will say, okay, does this guy have the right password for this user account? And if you do, then it will return a response that has a cookie, and the cookie will authenticate you to that website. And then the browser can use that so you can navigate the site and stay logged in. If we didn't have cookies, we'd have to re-log in every time we went to a different page on Amazon.com. <laughs> he says, good. I think that's, most people would find that a little bit annoying. Um, but maybe it's good. You can turn off cookies in your browser if you want that experience. Um, so they're also occasionally used for site-wide preferences, like setting a language, uh, for example. Um, but they can also be used for tracking. Again, anything that lets you set persistent state in the browser will let you do this. And tracking cookies often look like these. This is actually one from my browser. Um, this is an ad tracking me right now. Um, and it looks like a kind of a long, what we call a high entropy string. It just looks like a lot of gibberish to most people. Um, great. So cookies have valid uses, but they can also be used uh, for tracking. No. No. The basic protocol hasn't really changed. Yeah. That's a great question. So um, in the browser itself, uh, it's a complicated question too, but basically the browser enforces that distinction. So one site typically, there's no way for it to access another site's cookies without having that domain name and being able to make requests. There are things you can do with JavaScript that people have built kind of like protections against. Um, and as always, if you're worried about a network attacker, you have to use encryption on the connection. So you have to use TLS. Um, on the connection between the server and the client, or else anybody in between can pull the cookie off the wire and use it. So that's how a lot of really common attacks, like uh, Fire Sheep was a big one a few years ago. That worked by being on open Wi-Fi network, listening for cookies on encrypted sites, and then copying them. And then you can use that as a proof of identity on a website and say, oh, I'm actually this guy at this website, and log in as them and do whatever you want. Um, so, OK, so cookies, there's cookies. And then we want to think about sites in two contexts. So there are first parties, and there are third parties. So a first party is a site that you go to directly. So if I type the name of a site, like a.com, very cool website, check it out, it's not real, um, in your browser bar and hit return, or if you click a link, or if you go somewhere in a search engine, then that's a first party site. You went to that site directly, and you chose to go there. Um, and we're going to have a little nomenclature. So uh, visually, a circle represents a first party site. So a.com here is a first party site. It's in a circle. Um, then there are third parties. And so third parties are sites that are loaded by first parties, but not directly by the, by the user themselves. So when a website, for example, embeds images or other content, they can come from other websites. And those are called third parties, like this one, t.com. For the rest of these slides, we're going to use circles as first parties and triangles as third parties. Hopefully, that's not too confusing. Um, so this is all about connections between websites. So in some third parties aren't necessarily trackers, but they can be. So in this example, we have a.com, a first party that we go to. And it loads resources from a third party called tracker.com. And it's going to want to track you. So this is how that works. The first time you go to a.com, it loads something from tracker.com for the first time, let's say. Tracker.com says, oh, well, I saw Bob, and it will make up a unique ID for you at this point. So he gets a request from you. It'll make up a unique identifier. Here we'll say Bob, because it's easier to say than a long random string. Um, and it'll say, OK, you're Bob now, and I saw you on a.com. And then what it'll do is it'll store that in its database locally, and it will set a cookie that contains that unique identifier, in this case, Bob. So the tracker will set a cookie associated with tracker.com, and it will send that back to the browser. So the browser will store it, as we explained. And later, you go to a different page on the same website, so a.com slash one. Again, this is the coolest website I've ever seen. Um, it also has content from tracker.com loaded on it in a third-party context. And because of the way that cookies work, the browser will say, oh, a request from tracker.com. Well, I actually have a cookie that I want to give you as soon as I load something from you. So it will send the same cookie that was originally set back to the tracker. This time, it will happen right away. And the tracker will say, oh, great, that cookie. Well, now I can say that I also saw Bob on a.com slash one. 
So this is the basic mechanism by which trackers can basically tag you, and they occasionally call these tags internally, um, and then follow you around as you navigate different sites on the same domain. And then this can kind of go back and forth. The tracker can update the cookie later. It can do all kinds of stuff, whatever it wants. But it has a way to keep updating this in this little tag that stays in your browser. So let's say that after that, you go to a different site, totally different site, b.com. And b.com, unfortunately, also uses tracker.com. It might use it for analytics, or it, maybe it serves ads. Um, but it's a third-party site embedded in a.com. And again, because it sees the request tracker.com, the browser will say, great, I have a cookie for you. And it will give them the cookie. And then the tracker can say, I also saw Bob on b.com. So now it can track you across websites. As long as the, the first party site loads content from the third party tracker, the tracker can know that you went to that site and any others that also embed that content. Does that make sense? A little bit, kind of getting some slow nods. OK, a little confusing. Um, so what you end up with is a thing like this, where there are many different sites that use tracker.com. In the real world, there are lots of large companies that do analytics or advertising, um, and they end up being embedded on lots of different sites. So as long as it's embedded on A, B, and C, the same tracker will get the same identifier from each of those sites, and they can track you across all of them. And then as a last thing, a little bit more brain busting, but a common example, there are some sites that you go to that are both first and third parties. So a lot of the ad tracking sites will have weird looking domain names that you would never go to of your own accord, because they're not really meant for you to go there. They don't actually have websites. They just serve tracking stuff. Um, but there are some sites that you do go to. One example would be Facebook.com. So you might have a Facebook account which you go to, and you log in, and you poke people, and do all the fun stuff you do on Facebook. Um, when you log in on Facebook, it gives you a cookie uh, that lets you be logged into Facebook. So this is a totally valid, classic, uh, originally intended use of a cookie that keeps you logged into the site for some period of time. But the problem is that you might go to a different site, let's say buzzfeed.com, which I never go to, but you might. Um, and it embeds facebook.com in a third party context. Now, this happens all the time. If you ever see a Facebook like button or a little widget that has a list of things your friends like on that page, that's third party content being embedded from Facebook directly. And so, since it's the same domain name but in a third party context, again, the browser will be like, oh, great, I have a cookie for you. And it will send Facebook Bob's cookie over to Facebook. And now Facebook can say, I saw Bob on BuzzFeed and I saw what he did there. So now the Facebook knows what happened on Facebook and also what happens on every site that uses like buttons. And that's a lot of websites. So that's called mixed party tracking, and it's a little bit trickier to think about. Um, so sometimes sites are both useful, and sometimes they are useful and also tracking you at the same time. So the question is, these are all very simple one and two examples. But what does it look like for your browsing history? OK, Lightbeam is a Firefox add-on that helps you visualize all of this complicated tracking that Garrett explained so well. So here's just a screenshot of the Lightbeam graph, which represents every site that you've visited and all of the connections and cookies that have been passed between them. So just like in the previous diagrams, the circles represent the, par the first parties that you visited by either clicking on a link or typing them into the URL bar. And the triangles represent third-party content that was either loaded onto the site or was setting a cookie. Um, and the reason why it's important to have visualization is because um, these relationships are very complex and difficult to understand by, say, just looking at HTTP headers for every website that you request. The way that Lightbeam works is that Firefox provides an API for add-ons to observe events that are related to cookies. So whenever Lightbeam sees one of these events, it parses out which website is responsible for the event, and then stores that information in your browser, and then uses that data to generate graphs and visualize them 
using d3.js, which is a visualization library. And now for a brief demo. So right before this talk, I wiped my light beam graph. You can see that um, it's data gathered since just now. I visited zero sites, and it's a big blank page. So now, if I open a new tab, and I, let's say, go to um, New York Times, is good. <laughs> New York Times. So just from looking at this page, which big is not done rendering. Big ads coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. What are your browser preferences? We'll talk my, about that at the end. My, mine are to accept all cookies right now. Um, so if, if it weren't for this huge Apple ad right at the top, it's, it's kind of hard to determine how many third parties the New York Times is including content from, especially since a lot of people don't scroll down to the bottom of the page. And a lot of them are also not visible at all. Right, they could be totally invisible. So how many people would like to take a guess as to how many third parties the New York Times includes on their homepage? How many cookie How many third parties that the New York Times includes on its homepage? 25%. Wow. That's really high. That is really high. We'll show <laughs> you one of those later. Oops. And the answer is actually? Uh, 14. 14. So. You can see that the Times has included um, um, third-party content from all these different domains. Scorecard research, um, Facebook, Typekit, Brightcove. A lot of them are analytics companies, and a lot of them are ad servers. And some of them are something called content distribution networks. Um, <clears throat> so let's just go to another site. Um, let's see Huffington Post. And we can see, hopefully, the light beam graph updating there we go. With, with a new little network of sites. Can make it a little bigger, maybe? Yes. Let me make that a little bigger. So um, like I said, the first party sites are the circles. So you can see that um, 52 third party sites have been visited. You can kind of gray those out to see that only two sites with a little Times icon and the HuffPo icon have been actually visited by the user on purpose. Um, you can see that the Times and Huffington Post both include third-party content from scorecard research. And actually, you can even find out what the, what the actual cookie values of those oh, yeah. looks like. So by going into your Firefox preferences, and then going to the and, privacy settings at the top. And then going, masks, yes. Which we're already at. Um, we can go to use custom settings for history. And you can see, as the gentleman asked, uh, what my cookie preferences were. And they were actually the default settings, which are to accept cookies from all sites. And now I can click on Show Cookies. I can look for Scorecard Research. And you can see that um, I have a cookie named UID, probably for unique identifier or user ID. And it has the same kind of high entropy string that Garrett observed in his own browsing history. So now, um, scorecardresearch.com has the ability to know that I went to both the New York Times and Huffington Post and probably all the articles that I've read on that site. And just for fun, I'll go to one last um, go Obamacare. Um, <laughs> one last site. It's a celebrity gossip site, and this is one of the most um, ridiculous. ridiculous graphs. <laughs> so you can see that the TMZ icon is this little atomic uh, icon, and it, in it includes 39. Um, it includes content from 39 um, third party sites. So one really cool thing about Lightbeam is that not only does it allow you to visualize the network connections that are being made implicitly, um, it allows you to block content uh, from sites. So we've been looking at the graph view so far, 
And over here on the left, you can select the list view from the vis visual visualization menu. And you can sort all of these sites by the type of site they are, um, the name, when, when you first went to them, how many sites were connected to them, and so on. You can see that Lightbeam uses a, a slightly different nomenclature than we were before. So what we call a first. So before I was saying that there are first party sites and third party sites, Lightbeam calls them visited sites, or first parties, and then they also call third parties third parties. So a little bit different, but otherwise the same. So um, I was going to say that Lightbeam has this really cool feature that you can use to block content from loading. And the way that you do it is you select a site. I'm just going to pick on scorecard research because we saw it previously. They were the first tracker. Yeah, one of the first. And then I'll go down here to Site Preferences and select Block Site. And when I do that, Lightbeam will pop up a little warning. And it says that blocking sites may adversely affect your internet browsing experience. Because after all, um, third party content is included for a reason. And sometimes it does break um, how the page is rendered. So, <clears throat> and later on, I'll show you how that can happen. So, um, going back now, so now scorecard research is blocked. And going back to the graph view, you can see that there's a little pink triangle. Um, indicating that scorecard research um, is no longer able to talk to Firefox. So just to show you an example of what can go wrong when you block sites, I'll go back to the list view. Let's block the New York Times. Click through the warning. Okay, now I'm on the TMZ website. I'll just close that tab. Oops and then try to go to the New York Times again. And it doesn't load because the connection never resolves. Um, <clears throat> so that's an example of how overzealous blocking can lead to breakage. So, um, exactly. Yes, exactly. So that's enforced by something that's called the NSI content policy, which if you're interested in, you can go and look it up how it works. And it basically, um, for every resource request, checks whether or not it should load. And um, we have told it not to load New York Times and scorecard research. That's, what I, th that's just what I tried to do. Oh. Oops. But it, I think it's actually loading this from the cache. Yeah, it is. So, Firefox, Firefox is an open source browser. Are you talking about? So that's uh, the decision of the people who make websites. And um, so the, the people who make websites make those decisions about what you see. And we just render faithfully what they give us. Um, there's a lot of debate over whether browsers should take a more active role in controlling what the user sees. But the way the web is designed, it's such that the, the user agent, so browsers are often called user agents. They're meant to act on behalf of the user and display websites as they were designed. So there are add-ons that you can get that will simplify, like the New York Times, and just pull out the article text. But by default, if the New York Times wants it to look that way and be full of ads, then we're just going to let it be that way. But you can use this add-on if you want to block certain kinds of behavior. You had a question. Yeah, what's the, uh, the yes, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> so um, that actually leads kind of into um, the next part of the talk, which is how can we make Lightbeam better? Um, and I'll just go ahead and talk about contributing data now. So um, your Lightbeam graph um, may be very useful and interesting to you. But it doesn't really help um, anybody else because they don't know what's in the graph. And so there is an opt-in. Um, it's off by default, but you have the option to contribute data back to Mozilla. And if you click on this, then what it will do is it'll send your Lightbeam graph 
back to Mozilla. And you might think, well, why would I want to do that? I've just gone through all of this trouble trying to avoid trackers, and now Mozilla is going to find out some stuff about my browsing history. And um, that's, that's a valid point. And um, the reason that you might want to contribute data back to Mozilla is that data in the aggregate can show us a different picture of the internet than any one particular individual's data. And so if we can use people's collected light beam data to do things like collectively identify tracking domains, then that's really powerful. And it can also, um, just like the AOL researchers were trying to do, um, use real data to inform technology and policies. Um, and obviously there's a danger in doing that, like we saw in the Times article, where the woman was re-identified just based on her search queries. So um, the plans that Mozilla has for this data include never releasing identifiable information back out to the public. So that means that only aggregated counts will ever be released back to the public. So just like you answer a census survey with a ton of personal information about yourself, the census publishes only aggregated counts of, of that data. Question? Is it intervals or every time I log in, I it's, it's actually only sent once per day. And like I said, it's off by default. I'm saying if I wanted to send the data, but I don't want to send just all of the data. Long, it's so right. Identified by my username, by who I right. That's actually not possible at the moment. Uh, but it's an interesting thing to... You mean you don't right. Right. But it would be possible to add that to your question. Absolutely. Um, yes, we'd have to think about how to accomplish that. Yeah. 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 Right. So the, it's, not, it's true that you will never be able to um, release an entire data set with all of its granularity and be able to guarantee anonymity. But I think that it's possible to say that Okay, so say that me and Alicia and Garrett and Imran all decide to submit data back to Mozilla using Lightbeam. And all of our data sets say that we visited the New York Times. So the person who receives all of that data, Mozilla, would be able to say, hmm, Alicia went to the Times, Garrett went to the Times, Monica went to the Times, you went to the Times. But the aggregate data would only say four people went to the Times. And I think for high volume domains, um, that would not be a privacy issue. Correct. So, but it's collected. Is it then, is it then, if someone else is it, is it then from your browser in a collected form? So, uh, you could imagine that like a, a, a exploit in the browser could steal it, but the data itself is not really different from the history that browsers all collect automatically. So, it's not like an additional risk. Uh, yes, but there's not much more additional information. Right, but that's a, that's a good concern, a good question. Anytime you collect a lot of data like this, you want to consider what could happen if you lost control of it. Yes. Well, so you can erase it. So you can, like, there's a button, I think. It's yes, like, it's actually this button, reset data. Yeah. So at any point, you can reset your data, and that will clear it out of the browser, and it won't send that data to Mozilla anymore. We'll have what we already got from you if you opt in, into it, but now it's no more, then you can turn it back off. And that, that actually, I think, hitting that button, reset the switch back to off, which is interesting. Yeah, that's good. It that's resets good. The, the whole state back to the installation state. Installation state, yeah. So. Absolutely. Right. So cookies are only one of the many types of local storage that are used to do tracking. And that's why the block site is so interesting, because it means that not only are cookies not accepted, but um, no network connection is made at all. So there's no possibility of using other forms of local storage. Thank you. So let's say you're using some uh, double click. Mm -hmm. yes. So you block double click. Yes. Now double click is using doubleclick.newyorktimes.com. So yeah. even if you block double click, double click can still get around by using a customized domain query. That's that is correct. absolutely true. So how will you block that? 
So that would take a lot more work, frankly. So um, there would have to be some sort of um, IP deduper that says that was able to figure out, hey, doubleclick.newyorktimes.net and doubleclick.cnn.com all point to the same places. And if one if the user wants to block traffic from DoubleClick, we actually need to block by, say, IP rather than domain name. And that gets into a lot of heuristics that um, will basically lead that to an want, arms race. That we want to talk about next, right? That we want to talk about next. Um, so moving on. Um, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> I love that slide. <laughs> so um, maybe I'll just talk about this briefly first. So. The current view in Lightbeam just pre presents a global view of all of your aggregated data since the beginning of time when you installed Lightbeam over all the sites that you visited. Except for, Except for since you installed Lightbeam or you reset it. <laughs> so um, that is actually not very useful when you're trying to figure out which connectives are active when, on the page that you're looking at right now. So having that current view is really important for understanding things like how blocking sites affects how the page is rendered, for example. Because if you block a domain that's not even being visited, then of course you're not going to see anything. Um, so these widgets uh, kind of give a kind of prototype how that might look. Um, so it, the one on the right says you're at imdb.com. You've got all these connections, and it's setting six cookies at the current tab view. And this could also belong in a sidebar. And now I see that sidebar is too small to see on the projection. But it just shows you, on a little sidebar, all the active connections. And that will update as you go from site to site. Right. So you can kind of see what's happening on each site. <clears throat> so um, and that leads into something that this gentleman over here was asking about, which is how can blocking be effective if you have to do all these ridiculous things and manually add sites to your block list and they, you might not even get all of the sites that you meant to block? And that's absolutely um, a valid criticism. So I think that we all have an intuition based on the light beam graphs um, what it what a tracking domain might look like. So when we saw the same third party domains being included by both the New York Times and Huffington Post and TMZ, um, those are definitely sites that have the ability to track users across the internet. And so what if we could use algorithms to map that intuition into automatically identifying tracking domains? So that's what we would like to do um, next for Lightbeam. There's a lot of exciting research that just recently came out of the University of Washington um, by Franzi Rosner and Tadashi um, Kono called Tracking Observer. And what this research does is it tries to classify different graphs um, it, based on um, what kind of tracking they do. And um, very similar to the example that Garrett stepped through where tracker.com was tracking um, the same user across a.com and b.com, um, we can identify that algorithmically. Um, and finally, getting back to the shared data question, um, we really want to make this data sharing thing effective at being able to identify tracking domains globally so that Lightbeam users don't have to wait until they build up their graph and visit all these tracking sites to block them. They can just Start up Lightbeam, select um, automatically block tracking domains based on everybody's aggregated data, and have it just work. And um, almost more importantly, I feel like a lot of the work that goes on in this space completely lacks any sort of science. And so um, by generating a data set that's safe to share with the world, I'm really hopeful that we can start making technical and policy decisions based on, based on evidence, based on real data. Um, oops. And finally, um, as you may have observed, 
Lightbeam has a couple of performance issues. It's actually a lot better than it used to be, but if we implement Lightbeam as part of Firefox rather than implementing it as an add-on, then we have more opportunity to improve things like performance and accuracy. Um, there are several privacy-related add-ons like Disconnect Me and Ghostery that um, don't interact very well with Lightbeam right now, and that reason is because um, we're hooking in at an API layer that where it's just impossible to resolve certain things like race conditions. So if we build it in natively, then we'll have more of an opportunity to both provide um, the same kinds of, we'll have a better opportunity to, to be more accurate and be faster, um, provide pr other privacy features, um, that popular add-ons like Adblock Plus, which blocks ads, um, Disconnect Me, which prevents you from talking to Facebook unless you really, really want to. Um, we'll have a better chance of making features like that work more consistently. Um, and I think I see some people with laptops, and I would love to help you guys try it out if there's, unless, if there's time. Could you walk through that a little bit? Absolutely. Sure, I can do that. Um, so if you guys have uh, a laptop um, and you want to try Lightbeam, these are the steps that you can follow. And we'll come around after I go through this and help you out individually if you need help. Um, but the first thing you have to do is get Firefox. So if you don't already have Firefox, you can go to getfirefox.com and download the latest version. What's up? So if you, if you don't opt in to sharing data with Mozilla, there is no exposure. I'll have to modify that. So if you don't already have Firefox installed, then you are increasing the number of software packages on your laptop that you have to maintain and so on. Um, but Right. Right, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so once you have Firefox, um, you can go to Mozilla's Lightbeam website. Um, that, that quotation mark is not part of it. It's just hanging out at the end there. Um, ignore that guy. There'll be a button that lets you download Lightbeam for Firefox, and that'll take you to a different page on our add on site. Did you show me the add on site? Yeah, I can just actually do this right now. So, assuming you already have Firefox, um, well, let's see. What's the best way to do this? Um, yeah, that's actually not the easiest thing in the world to do, but I think I. Yeah, I think, and I think we can fine. just do this. No. That won't open another one? That usually does. Do, do, do. Uh, anyway, yeah, so we'll just do that. So what you can do is, um, if you don't have Firefox in another browser, you can go to this page. Um, and this will figure out what kind of computer you have and give you a link. We already have the latest version of Firefox, so we're awesome. So we're not going to do that. Um, and then what you'd want to do is go to this site mozilla.org slash lightbeam. Um, and this is the Lightbeam homepage. And down here, you'll see a little download Lightbeam for Firefox button. So you can click on that, and it'll go to the add-ons page. You'll see this site. And then now you'll see that this button is green over here, and it says Add to Firefox. So you can hit that. Um, we can't really go any further because we already have it, and it'll do some silly stuff. but. Once you hit that button, um, you'll get a pop-up that asks you if you're sure you want to install it. And you'll say, I want to allow it. Um, and then you'll say, you kind of go through some stuff, and then you'll install it. What's up? What about between tablet or iPhone or that type of thing? That we currently run Unfortunately, it's not supported for mobile right now, which is one of the things that I really want to get the tab view working for. Because it doesn't make sense otherwise. Yeah, it just isn't working. What's up? So while I'm in the group, can I just select the latest stuff and then close it? Um, the ones I get underway? My opinion is that uh, running an ad exchange is actually a very complicated and expensive proposition. And um, not very many companies have the expertise to do that, actually. Oh, but uh, it's just now, right? That would take you even software to do that. I actually don't believe that's true. I don't think it's easy to run a service just because somebody gives you the source code. You also have to provision the entire infrastructure. 
But what DoubleClick is doing now is easier for them, and they get more information. They don't have any financial incentive to do that. Potentially, potentially. So there's lo there are. I think that it's really important to consider alternative models for how to fund the internet because that is the core of why tracking is becoming such a widespread problem. There are a lot of options. Um, one model is an ad exchange with uh, content providers. Um, another idea might be that third-party trackers are trying to observe the behavior of individual users, but no one tracker is included on all sites. So they only get an incomplete picture of the internet, and they do a lot of analysis and data mining to try and improve their picture, and they exchange data with other companies that's called retargeting um, in order to try and, and clarify this fuzzy picture of who you are and what you want to buy. Um, but there is one party, only one party actually, that has a perfect view, and that's your browser itself. Um, so there might be some ideas, which Mozilla is exploring, um, to find a way to do advertising in a privacy conscious way from the start um, with the entity that has the information already, which is your browser. Um, but that's still very nascent, and I'm, yeah. But that's, that's another option. Um, or you could mine Bitcoin in your browser and then pay sites with Bitcoin, um, which some guys tried in New Jersey and they got sued. Or they tried it in, at MIT and then they got sued by New Jersey. Um, so that's a little bit questionable. Yeah. So um, the data that we collect is covered by the privacy policy that's, that was shown at the pop-up and also by the Mozilla privacy policy. Um, so it's not licensed under Creative Commons. Um, the aggregated data that we would share back with the world, um, to be honest, it has a limited lifespan um, because, because um, browsing data changes so much over time, it's very unlikely that, say, more than two weeks worth of graph history would be very useful to anybody. So I'm not sure if we can or even should keep it in perpetuity. And in fact, I would feel much more comfortable even at even with aggregated data, destroying it after um, some period of time. It's it's possible. Right. Exactly. public interest litigators would be interested in this kind of data if they're bringing a case for like a privacy suit, whether it be for an individual or class action. So would that data not be available to them? Um, so public so, data is public data, right? So I, th I think that um, we didn't quite clarify, but what we want to do is collect data that is precise, and then Mozilla will have that data stored internally, and we can use it for studies. And the reason for that is because if we totally anonymize the data at the outset, it really, really limits what kind of analysis you can do with the data. But then when it goes to actually sharing it publicly, we would have to do, like Monica said, a lot of processing to anonymize the data and do a kind of a census transformation where it goes from being user, like we can't do what AOL did where they give everyone a random ID, right? Because yeah. that's trivially um, uh, identifiable, right? But we can give counts, we can say, well, this is the most common tracker seen by this many users, and that is identifiable, but I'm not sure how it would impact public suits or public litigation. So when you give the data back out, hasn't it been distilled into a table of places you don't want to go? Or <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So that that's one chance for person to help create it. Right, that, and that would be a goal of the data is to produce a list of commonly seen trackers um, that can be used by the add-on by default, possibly. Yeah. But there are other things that I might want to, like researchers would want to see more than that. They would want to see like the most commonly seen domains and counts of them. But as long as it isn't being individuated, then it's uh, less of a privacy risk. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so the question was, um, how effective is this really if uh, the bad guys are at tracker.com and we block it, can't they just start operating at tracker2.com and play that game forever? So there's a never ending arms race and they are always ahead of us. Um, the first thing is that 
It's not that hard to get a, a domain name, and you can make your own subdomains willy-nilly, but it does cost money, um, and there is a non-trivial infrastructural cost. Like, to get every customer of an advertising network to switch over to a new domain name is by no means trivial, right? Because that's their code that they have to change. Um, but more importantly, the cool thing about a thing like Lightbeam is that it's automatically generating a list of trackers by observing the sites. So if they change the domain name, that within a few hours, within a few couple requests, we can say, oh, well, this is a new domain name. I don't care if it is tracker 2 or tracker 3 or tracker 535, but it's still tracking you, and we're still going to block it. Oh, I'd like to just to add one more thing, which is that um, for any, any problem, any privacy violation, I think that technological countermeasures are only one half of the story. If that. Um, there's also the policy and legislation side. Um, and pretty much, I wouldn't say all, but a large uh, portion of work has been done on privacy and tracking um, that Alicia can speak to much better than me. The whole do not track effort um, was largely a policy effort, I would say. So do not track is a very simple thing where a web browser just announces to every site that it visit, visits, hey, I don't want to be tracked. And then it's up to the website to, to obey that desire. And um, part, part of the work that we're talking about is how do we make do not track enforceable on the client side rather than just making it a request, a policy decision that websites can choose to allow to obey or disobey. And so without both sides of that coin, the technology side and the, and the policy side, or you know, the, the stick and the carrot, um, it's, I think it's very unlikely that we'll make progress in this space. The question was, is private browsing effective at stopping tracking? And the answer is no. Private browsing will clear cookies on when you exit the session, but you can still be tracked within that session, for sure. Oh, my question was, um, I wasn't sure if I misinterpreted, but t when it says the source of the person who's tracking you, how far does that go? Does that go to, to private businesses? Does it go to further to if it's like a government-related agency? The source of the, I'm sorry? The tracker. So if it's like, if it says um, a triangle and says this, yes. this website is tracking you or this right. domain name is tracking you, is there, will there be something that goes further to say who that entity actually is? Is oh, you want to see what's, what company owns scorecardresearch.com. That's a great or feature idea, but company. we don't have that currently. Okay. Um, so Disconnect Me, which is another add-on that does some, some similar things, actually will do that. It will try to identify tracking companies to their tracking domains, and it will offer links to those companies' homepages so you can go directly to them and check them out. Maybe you'd want to vet them and decide that they're actually cool. Which is... It's called Disconnect.me. So we try to, to start and end on time if we can. Um, I want to thank our speakers today very, very much for coming out. Um, thank you so much. It's a great talk. Um,